Um, there's a cottage industry that uh, grew throughout the 20th century, uh, determined to prove that Karl Marx was anti-Semitic, based partly on this notorious essay of his. And it's best expressed in an otherwise very important book by what was once a social democratic who became a neoconservative writer, Paul Johnson. People of my generation will remember him as, a, as some kind of leftist from the 1960s. And his book, A History of the Jews, I actually recommend it. It's a very good book. It's actually recommended in all our university jury studies courses. And like most serious books, actually, it partially concedes to the Marx and Leon analysis of Jewish history as it happens. But when he gets to Marx, it's just not, not just that Marx is anti Semitic. He makes the claim that because Marx, which he didn't say, said that most Jews are capitalists and therefore when it came to writing Capital and the three volumes of Capital therefore are more or less like Mein Kampf as a kind of uh, anti-Semitic three volume tract I assure you it's as bad as that in Paul Johnson he is the worst exponent but there is both a scholarly and a media and a propagandist uh, as I say movement, cottage industry determined to prove this that's the first point the second point I want to make in terms of health warning is Marx's writing as what he was when he wrote the essay in 1843 a young Hegelian his writing is not good there's a very interesting book which I use extensively by a new author who I didn't come, come across before called David Leopold. He's at Oxford. A very good book on young Marx. He's got a whole section on why Marx wrote so badly. Engels put it very simply. Engels just said, Mark, young Marx wrote badly like all German philosophers. Um, <laughs> Alex Kalinikos summed it up very nicely and just said the problem was Marx was too fond of punning. I want to just add an adjective. It's very, two adjectives, it's very bad, or qualified adjective, it's very bad punning. And the final point I want to make by way of introduction is it's important to know when you deal with this, Marx has not even begun to analyse capitalism properly. Not at all. He's got no economic analysis. He's writing at a very early stage and um, that's also a factor to bear in mind. Now, having, said, having cleared the decks as it were, there are two central points very positive points about Marx's essays. An essay he wrote in 1843 on the Jewish question. Or three central points. He's actually fighting with, at the time, a very famous follower of Hegel, a left Hegelian called Bauer, who is anti-Semitic and becomes viciously anti-Semitic as he gets older. And Marx is fighting with him over the question of Jewish emancipation. Marx is defending Jewish emancipation against Bauer. It's crucial to keep that point in mind. And the second point to keep in mind, if people have seen the journal, they might have also noticed John Molyneux's article on Marxism and religion, where John quite rightly makes the point that we are materialists when we talk about religion. We believe religious ideas come from real activities of human beings. And in a way, Marx is using the Jewish question essay to develop and test that argument. Because he asks the question, I want to kind of begin to get into the discussion here now, he asks the question... How did the Jews survive? Why is there Jewish survival? After all, if you look at the three... I want to make one final... Sorry, one final qualification too. Health warning. I'm going to resist the temptation to read quotes from Marx when I do this. One, it's a time waster in such a short period of time. And two, I think it's really important to um, try to get in simple English, because the English isn't simple, or the German wasn't simple either, to the key points. So I'm going to avoid... Uh, 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 quotation. I'm not going to quote an important quote, I'm going to use my own words to describe what he's trying to do, which is arguing about Jewish survival, and he's, so, he's more or less saying, look, there are three great monotheistic religions. Yes, Judaism came first, and there was Christianity and Islam. Actually, they are far more successful. How come Judaism, which has a much smaller base, as it were, survived from antiquity to modernity? And he says there is, he says there is an economic base. He's essentially he's saying uh, that the Jews were a trading community from late antiquity to the present time, or until at some point, as it doesn't, it hasn't discovered capitalism yet, but uh, in terms of capitalism rising over a long period of time then. So that's his... Theory, that's the theory that he's arguing. Now he's defending Jewish emancipation and he's using the model of the French Revolution from 1789. The French Revolution had indeed emancipated the Jews. And that meant freedom of religion, freedom of religious worship, and it also meant equal citizens' rights. And Marx is saying that's incredibly important. Jews in Germany, and Germany is very backward in terms of those sorts of developments, so revolutions anticipated. Marx is saying, of course, Jewish people are entitled to those rights. But he goes further than that, because he's exploring the concept of emancipation itself in this essay. Now, this is extremely complex and dense to follow through. 
Um, but I think what he's saying here is that emancipation, that form of emancipation is extremely limited. And he says, and he picks on the notion of individual rights. And he says, yes, those rights are important, but the individualism contained in those rights is itself a problem. And he says, in this kind of society we're moving into, there's pressure for greater and greater individualism. He uses the word egoism, the concept or idea of egoism, quite a lot. Individual egoism. A sort of extreme selfishness is wrapped up in this. And this is, there's quite a few pages discussing this. And he says this also is part of the private-public split which has developed in our epoch, you know, in, in this period. It's a, it's a form of alienation, a concept is also developing at the time. So it's, it's only halfway has emancipation. He wants to know how can we get to full emancipation. And he's saying, and, he, and, and, and there's a, a two, two lines in particular that he discusses here. He talks, going back to the question of religion, he talks about, well, as a matter of fact, human beings haven't been freed from religion, they've received the, re they've received the, individu the individual right to be religious. And more crucially, and much more difficult for us, he also says human beings haven't been freed, I use his phrase exactly, have not been freed from the egoism of trade, they've received the right to become traders, to become individual traders. Now this is where it gets difficult and controversial. Because in the Germany of that day, of his time, the early 1840s, trade, commerce, and the German word Judentum, Jewishness, were the same thing. Jewishness had the secondary meaning of commerce. It was taken for granted that not only that Jewish people were traders, but that trade was somehow dominated by them. And insofar as trade was massively expanding, Marx even goes on to say, Christians are becoming Jewish, insofar as Christians are becoming traders. And we come, and taking that into account, we then come to his most notorious line, in my opinion, when he comes to the question, how then do we get complete emancipation? Human beings, and Jewish human beings included, will only emancipate themselves when mankind emancipates itself from Judaism, i.e. from trade. But this is very bad punning, it's enormously damaging, it's carry, here carries the legacy, the bad legacy. That, in, in essence is what the essay is trying to do. Now, is Marx anti-Semitic? Marx himself very rarely addressed that. In fact, it's part of the cottage industry is to say that Marx never acknowledged his Jewish background. Well, David Leopold says that's not true. A, I, this, is, this is the one occasion I'm going to do a quote because it's such a brilliant quote from Marx himself. He's still arguing with Bauer. Later on, this goes on for several years, the argument with Bauer. And he says as follows. He said that, that Bauer's accused the Jews of being an eyesore. And Marx responds... Something which has been an eyesore to me from birth, as the Jews have been to the Christian world, and which persists and develops through the eye, is not an ordinary sore, but a wonderful one, one that really belongs to my eye, and must even contribute to a highly original development of my eyesight. I just think that's superb. And it just kind of cuts through all the nonsense. But there's something else, in a way even more fascinating, I think, that Marx was not the originator of this link with, between Jews and trade. And here I want to pay credit to a young Jewish scholar's, uh, scholar student uh, at University College called Lars Fischer, who's written a book just in the last uh, couple of years, who's explored in detail Marx's essay and the response of German social democracy over the 19th century, who, com who continued to misinterpret it, who not only, and Lars Fischer is not a uh, Marxist, not at all, but he insists not only that Marx is not anti-Semitic, but he says that Marx got the ideas from an older contemporary called Moses Hess. There are several Actually, more than several, there are a lot of young Hegelians of Jewish origin, most famously Heinrich Hein with Marx, but also Moses Hess. Moses Hess, says Fisher, and there's plenty of further evidence to demonstrate this, started the argument of the link between Jews and trade, and this is a big problem, says Hess. And Hess is also one of the inspires, inspirations for Zionism. Isaiah Berlin, one of the great British liberal philosophers of the 20th century, explicitly attacks Marx for being an anti-Semite, but defends Moses Hess because Moses Hess was a Zionist, and ignores the fact that Moses Hess started this argument about the link between Jews and trade. And one of the reasons why Hess becomes a Zionist, and there's a link to Zionism, the link to Zionism is very important, because of course, I'm not going to say there's an element of truth in this argument, but it, it is true that in the Germany of the day, Jews were very visible, or some Jews were very visible, what I'll call the money economy. 
And this was a great concern to a number of radical Jewish people, including those who became nationalists, and including Moses Hess and many of his disciples, who then took the journey to Palestine. And they said, all these Jews involved in trade, whether they're big bankers or shopkeepers or mainly peddlers, itinerant peddlers, which most of them were, these are non-productive occupations. What Jewish people need are productive occupations, and what could be better than becoming agriculturalists? And what could be better than to go to Palestine, etc., etc.? It's not a meeting about Palestine, but it's very important to underline this aspect of the argument. And so, to a degree, these are absolutely crucial qualifications, but the most important point of all is that after this essay, Marx drops the argument. It never appears again. In fact, when he begins to develop his analysis of capitalism properly, and in his three volumes of Capital, first of all, there are hardly any references to Jews at all, and one famous reference reverses the argument completely. It says that far from being Jews and being anyway central to the growth of the capitalist economy, they are marginalised when the market begins to grow rapidly uh, in the kind of late medieval period. And it's at that point that Abraham Leon picks up a different sort of argument. I'm going to come back to Leon in a couple of seconds. But one thing we do have to consider is how did this happen anyway? Why was there this kind of what I'll call, what modern sociologists might call, a kind of moral panic with Jews and money in the 1840s in Germany? And I think it's a very interesting question. One of Marx's critics, a man called Karl Beck, I think actually answers it with a semi-Marxist argument. What he says is that the peculiarities of, pu- of, of German feudalism, and Prussian feudalism in particular, the Prussian Junkers, the Prussian landlords, use the richer Jews to bring in capitalism to kind of head off the German bourgeoisie. The kind of tension between the, the backward class and the kind of progressive class of the day, and the Jews were kind of used very cynically. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting that Hannah Arendt, famous Jewish philosopher, American Jewish philosopher, has a lot of writings untranslated until recently. New Left Review at the end of last year talked about some of her most recent writings, and she also argues precisely that point. And so I, I think there that's an area that's worth exploring. But I do now want to move to Abraham Leon and this kind of other argument that whilst Abraham Leon accepts the basic premise of Marx's view that Jewish people survived over such a long period of time because of this trading function, nevertheless Jews are marginalised when capitalism begins to develop. Let's just go back to the first part of that proposition. Uh, Abraham Leon, by the way, is an enormously fascinating character. Abraham Leon's writings were discovered by um, a French Marxist called uh, Maxime Rodin- Rodin- Rodinson in the 1960s, and uh, a Leon's essay, was pu- a book was published for the first time in 1968, Leon wrote his book as the leader of a Trotskyist group in Belgium under Nazi occupation. And, and he was a leader of a political activist as well as writing this, what turns out to be a magnificent manuscript, and he was caught by the Nazis and he perished in Auschwitz. Um, which, as I say in my article, in a way, uh, you know, Che Guevara has a kind of uh, special attraction for the students of 68, for many Jewish students. Abraham Leon was an, had, had an even greater attraction in terms of his courage, but also in terms of, in many ways, he has a touch of Marx's genius in his writings, because he fleshes out Marx's argument. He traces Jewish history using this analysis from antiquity to, uh, as I say, what he regards as the beginnings of capitalism. Now, I'm conscious of the time. I don't want to dwell in great detail about this. I just want to give three examples of how this works. Um, Leon takes a crucial moment in antiquity that all the Zionists take. And by the way, very important to say that Leon's argument challenges head on the Zionist view that Jews, Jewish people have suffered 18 centuries of suffering since the so-called exile at the time of the fall of the Second Temple under the Roman Empire occupation. Leon challenges that view at a number of different levels. First of all, there aren't periods, it isn't just one long period of Jewish suffering. Anti-Semitism has to be explained, at least in part, not just in religious terms, also in terms of the economic role that Jewish people were playing. But also, Leon challenges the whole exile thesis, which is that there was a Jewish diaspora long before the fall of the Roman, uh, before, the, b- before the fall of the, of the Jewish temple in the Roman Empire, there was a Jewish diaspora throughout the Roman Empire, and crucially, there was a very large Jewish population in the city of Alexandria. I did a Jewish Studies MA the, uh, several years ago, before I wrote the Myths of Zionism, but many of the researchers I did then contributed to the book. I was very fascinated to track Leon's argument using up-to-date sources, and it was superb, because Jewish Studies is a flourishing topic throughout many universities uh, throughout the world, and independent Jewish studies 
theorists, are, they're not coming to our Brownian conclusions because they aren't Marxists, but they are confirming a whole number of his propositions based on the evidence they're unearthing. So, for example, Alexandria this is the most important port city in late antiquity on the North Egypt coast has a third Jewish population and quite clearly uh, more wealthy Jews are, are part of the merchant class in Alexandria and Leon develops this argument and modern uh, later theorists and later historians have developed a similar sort of argument. Again, uh, moving forward to the early medieval period, a, a, a recent Jewish studies, uh, two authors who've looked at Jewish economics in the early medieval period talk about Jewish traders being mediators between, the, I'm almost quoting word for word here, between, be, 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 being mediators between the empires of Islam and the empires of Christianity. Multilingual traders with Jewish trading communities along trade routes through Western, Central and Eastern Europe as early as the 9th and 8th centuries. Charlemagne, the great European uh, medieval, early medieval king from France, was written about by, of all people, a man called Abba Iban, who uh, was a famous or infamous uh, Israeli uh, minister several generations ago now. Um, he's also a classic scholar. Actually, his book's worth looking at. It's a, uh, it was based on a TV program that he made called Heritage, Civilization, the Jews. In the 19, in, 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 uh, uh, he made the film in the 1980s. So sort of, it's a pop Jewish history, but he also makes fantastic concessions to Leon. There's a whole section on Charlemagne being surrounded by Jewish advisors. Is that Charlemagne's Jewish advisors were, didn't just advise him on trade and finance, they controlled his trade and finance. And that history is also peppered with similar examples. So I am absolutely certain that this argument holds based on up to date research, just as it held for Leon when he did his research in the 1940s. Now, a question for me I find very interesting is whether or not it's the case, as both Marx seems to imply in Capital, and Leon certainly reinforces, that as the market begins to develop, as capitalism begins to develop in the late feudal, late medieval period, let's say the 12th, 13th centuries, and the Jews are kind of marginalised, that means there's no kind of Jewish contribution to the rise of, of capitalism. And I, one of the things I learnt during the Jewish Studies course is that doesn't really, that part doesn't hold. But just before we get there, let's just, let's just dwell for a moment on, the, on the, the expulsions of the Jews from Western Europe. Uh, Jews were expelled from England, for example, in the late 13th century. But the most spectacular expulsion was the Spanish Inquisition. Spanish Jews fled from Spain. But there was a similar pattern of expulsions right across Western Europe. And the market was expanding rapidly in that period. And it's certainly the case, and again, up-to-date research confirms this, that the reason for the expulsion, yes, of course, there's anti-Semitism in a traditional sense, in a religious sense, and so on, but there's also competition. This is clash between new and old traders. This is a clash between old Jewish traders and new Christian traders. And it's sweeping. It's very, very widespread. And you get this migratory pattern to Eastern Europe, and Poland in particular. And the importance of this insight is especially to be underlined, because... Many of my Jewish friends are in this room. I think we're all Ashkenazi Jews, and we probably all got um, ancestors who came from Poland or from Russia, but that kind of part of Middle Eastern Europe. And it's partly because of those earlier expulsions that the majority of the world's Jewish population ended up in what became known as the Pale of Settlement m many years later, at the beginning of the 19th century, but as a result of those expulsions from Western Europe, the concentration of Jews in Eastern Europe, where capitalism wasn't breaking through. Now, even that, however, I believe has to be qualified, and I'll come back to that later. That's an incredibly important uh, historical pattern which has been reinforced and confirmed by, uh, by, 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 by recent research. Now, I want to come to where I think there are both difficulties with Leon's analysis, but at the same time, with a little bit of thought, I think we can refine the analysis and provide some new insights which aren't just useful for themselves, but also help us to understand anti-Semitism in the modern world and indeed Zionism and how to tackle it. Because I am arguing that recent research suggests that there was a kind of Jewish revival, a trading revival, uh, later on, just before the Enlightenment. There's a massive expansion of trade with the opening up of the American, with the Americas, North and South, in the American market. There's a fascinating if people really want to follow this, I've got, obviously, the references are in my article. There's a particularly important uh, historian, Jewish historian from Jewish studies called Jonathan Israel. He studied the Jewish merchant class between 1550 and 1750, and he shows the most massive expansion of their role and the readmittance of some Jewish traders into Western Europe. In fact, of course, Cromwell famously, 
readmitted the Jews in 1655, and Cromwell is quoted wanting that he's having a fight to get Jews in, but he's quoted saying the Jews should come back to help us, to help us trade and traffic. Not to dominate us, but to help us trade and traffic. It was taken for granted. This is a, a central Jewish role, which Cromwell and the progressive elements of the bourgeoisie of the day saw as something that was important. And this is true, according to Jonathan in Israel, right across uh, Central and Western Europe. Now, what I try to do in my article, I want to just touch on this now in terms of why I think it's useful, providing you insights, is to look at this phenomenon in terms of case studies. How are we doing on time? Oh, sorry. You, so I haven't given you five okay. minutes yet. You've got about ten minutes. Okay, that's very much right. Um, because in all sorts of ways, I find this incredibly interesting. I want to come back to the Spanish Inquisition. It's a peculiar thing. I mean, the Holocaust is given, quite correctly, enormous historical coverage. Now, of course, it's very recent. Everyone's heard of the Spanish Inquisition, I expect. I wonder how many people ever read a book about it. But, and it wasn't the Holocaust, it wasn't as bad as the Holocaust, but it was the, it was the severest attack on Jewish people in Europe at, of its day, and it was absolutely ferocious, not just in terms of the expulsions, but in terms of the obsession with Jews who converted. The thing about the Spanish Inquisition, it was all about Jews who converted, and were they really Christian, or were they secretly Jews? And we really want to know about it, and we suspect that you're still a Jew, and you better come and talk to us about it. If you don't, we're going to talk to you. If we find any way you're still Jewish, we're going to talk to you anyway. And thousands of Jews got caught up in this Inquisition. It went on for a very long time. And the question is, why? And beginning to read about the Spanish Inquisition, one realises that although most Jews had indeed been kicked out of Spain, those who converted did indeed begin to play quite important both economic, financial and administrative functions in the new United Spain. And United Spain, by the way, which of course begins the great mercantile empire building of the 14th and 15th centuries. And uh, there are a whole number of converted Jews that are central to this. And there's an obsession in what becomes the Spanish ruling class wanting to know just how Christian they really were. And I, when I wrote about this, or I've written about it in the article, I, 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 we've got an interesting lesson here in the way at that early period, Jews become a kind of lightning conductor for both the strengths and weaknesses of the rising market and the rising capitalism. Of course they didn't dominate the process, but the kind of obsession with them continued, began then and continues to provide throughout the centuries a kind of way of taking pressure off the system by saying that Jews are somehow responsible for it. It begins with the Spanish Inquisition, not with those who are expelled so much, but those who stayed behind as converted to Christianity, but their, their true um, uh, conversions are continually questioned. Were they secretly being Jewish? Were they going to, re were they going to come back to their old religion, etc.? That's one example. I want to give a very different example. I got very interested in Shylock, famous uh, uh, a Jew in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. If you apply this different kind of argument, it raises a different kind of question. The traditional left-wing interpretation of Shylock is that Shylock has been reduced to a money lender, a poor money lender, by being knocked out by the Christian traders, who themselves are the heroes. The Christian merchant Antonio is a hero, and Shylock is a horrible little Jewish money lender that uh, demands his pound of flesh, etc. Now, the left-wing interpretation of it is... It's, it's his anti-Semitism, that uh, Jews have been squeezed out in this way. But I was interested in, in, in applying this different theory. I'm not saying this is correct. And with Shakespeare, I'm saying both of these arguments can coexist. But you could also, if you change the word moneylender to banker, you could argue that Shylock is a banker, and that bankers and merchants are also interchangeable, and that the real problem that the Christian merchants had with Shylock is he remains a competitor for them. Now, I don't want to go into the detail of this. I did a little bit of research, both in terms of England of the day and in terms of Italy of the day, and this argument does fit many of the facts. It's very interesting, incidentally, that there were no banks in Shakespeare's day, but there were lots of Christian moneylenders, formerly Catholics, were becoming Protestants because the Protestants were taking a very different view to usury money lending. And they, what, what one writer calls there were bankers without banks. So I do insist that this argument does begin to have some way of sustaining it. I then look briefly at Spinoza, a very different way of approaching the subject. Nothing in principle to do with Jews involved in money. On the contrary, one of the points I want to make is there's a Jewish contribution. What I really want to say about this is, when I say that there's two dangers in this argument. One is 
Jews are simply excluded from capitalism, or the anti-Semitic argument Jews, Jews dominate capitalism. I'm saying they're both wrong. That what I call a modest Jewish contribution to the rise of capitalism, and it's not just about economics, it's also about ideas and about philosophy. And, and in particular, Spinoza is one of the great philosophers, if not the greatest philosopher, of the Enlightenment. And what's intri- intriguing about Spinoza's life, he comes from a big merchant family of conversos, Portuguese conversos, that's to say Jews who'd converted to Christianity in Portugal and rediscovered their Judaism when they got to Amsterdam because of the pressure of the Portuguese Inquisition. There's lots of merchant families in Amsterdam at that time and of course Holland itself is an expanding mercantile economy of the 17th century and Spinoza is quite fascinating. It's almost weird that he kind of follows the model of that notorious sentence in Marx because as Spinoza becomes a philosopher he gives up his merchant activities as the family business because he wants to concentrate on philosophy so to emancipate himself he emancipates himself from being a merchant now it's probably just a coincidence it's a wonderful poetic coincidence especially because it's Spinoza and then he goes on of course the significance of Spinoza is he clears all the kind of medieval and mystical baggage for the rise of science amongst other things he helps provide a scientific understanding of, of society Incidentally, you could argue what's this got to do with Jews? After all, Spinoza becomes an atheist. I rather like Isaac Deutsch's argument about this, that those Jews who do become atheists and make serious contributions are non-Jewish Jews. I think those of us in the room who still hold on to our Jewish identity like to regard ourselves as non-Jewish Jews. I think it's a rather brilliant concept. But there's something else about Spinoza, is that the reform movement, about well, shortly after Spinoza, as capitalism begins to develop, there's an enormous uh, movement for reform, not just by the authorities who want to reform what Jews do, but by the Jewish reform movement. And the most famous Jewish reformer is in Germany called Moses Mendelssohn. He wants to reform, he wants to get the rabbis off Jewish people's backs, he wants to make sure that Jewish people can go into any occupation, not just occupations dominated by trade and finance and so on. And Mendelssohn reads Spinoza, Mendelssohn wants to use Spinoza as a, as a source book, or all his books as source books, to establish a new way of being Jewish, which I find extremely fascinating, because Spinoza was essentially, thanks, Spinoza was, well not essentially, Spinoza, Spinoza was an atheist. So I'm kind of flagging up a whole number of, uh, of interesting uh, patterns of, of, of investigation with this theory. Two, I'm, I'm, I've only got five minutes, I'm really going to do headlines here. Two other case studies. The House of Rothschild, actually this began, I have to admit, This whole way of thinking began when I read Niall Ferguson, famous American neoconservative, was given first-time access to the Rothschild family papers. There's two volumes, and it's a completely brilliant book. All I say about it is this. Rothschild Bank dominated European capitalism in the 19th century. The Rothschild Banks, the brothers, introduced the railway system into France just as Marx was beginning to write. As a matter of fact... Ferguson himself identifies Rothschild in the argument Marx is having with Bauer in the Jewish question. He, perso- he says, absolutely, it's, it's no, I'm convinced by it. He's talking about Rothschild, he's talking about Jewish power. Of course, he's wrong to talk about Jewish power, but the importance is that Rothschild were enormously powerful Jewish bankers. The earlier Rothschild, the father of the Rothschild brothers, walked out of the Frankfurt ghetto in the latter part of the 18th century. The Frankfurt ghetto was where many, many Jews were crowded into, for explicit, blatant, vicious anti-Semitism at its elementary Christian hostility to Jews level but also because they were perceived as competitors. There's a fantastic quote from Goethe in the famous German writer in Ferguson showing Goethe in the ghetto in Frankfurt being fascinated by the high intelligence as he sees it of all the Jews he's meeting and the way in which they've been, pre- they've been marginalised to make way for the uh, Christian economy to develop. The Rothschild Bank is fantastically important. It's generally widely accepted now that the Rothschild, to a degree, invented modern banking. The the role that the central banks now have been playing very badly in recent years, that whole mechanism intervention was pioneered by them. Very different example. Very finally, I'm going to bring, bring my remarks to a close on this. I want to come back to the Jews of Poland. In the Leon argument, the Jews of Poland simply get absorbed by Polish feudalism. It's much more interesting than that. According to most recent research, the first wave of Jewish migrants end up in eastern Poland running the big farms for Polish absentee and obviously Catholic landlords. They're trapped between the peasants and the big landowners who let the Jewish uh, administrators run their farms for them. And those farms are very productive. In fact, those farms produce huge amounts of grain which are then transported 
exported to Western Europe, helping to feed the rising population based on the rising expansion of trade in Western Europe at that time. And those Jewish leaders, for a moment, are extremely powerful, and they actually uh, 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 are in many ways the leading Jewish authorities throughout Europe. In the late 15th century, there's a massive uprising in Ukraine. And there's a, a lot of bloodletting, a lot of Jews are killed, a lot of Catholic landlords are killed by Ukrainians, anti-Semitic, but also nat uh, nationalist uprising. And the beginnings of, if you like, Jewish decline begin. And there's a long period of both Jewish and Polish decline. Poland, of course, is partitioned by the partitioning powers of Russia, Prussia and Germany later on. I want to get, I'm, I'm really doing this in terms of headlines. I want to get to a moment at the beginning of the uh, 20th century or the late 19th century when there are indeed a majority of the world's Jewish population are in that part of the world which becomes known as the Palo Settlement of the Tsar's Empire and those are impoverished Jews, many of whom have fallen from previously more privileged position but they're extremely poor and what's terribly fascinating about them is that as they begin to rediscover some kind of new and modern political consciousness, the consciousness they discover is very often a socialist consciousness because they are poor Jews and they've been to organise as Jewish workers and the Jewish workers are often at the forefront of the wider Russian and Polish workers' struggle in the, in, in, in the years that begin the Russian Revolution, first of all, in 1905. But of course, something else, I will end on this note, this is also the moment when Zionism takes off. It's always worth remembering Zionism likes to present itself as a kind of worldwide response to anti-Semitism. As a matter of fact, the Zionist cadres, nearly all of them, are based in this period. They're nearly all taken from Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century as a result of the extreme pressures. Because, of course, the Tsarist empire, in its collapse turns on traditional anti-Semitism, blames the Jews just because they're Jews and they killed Christ, but also because Jews are somehow involved in the new capitalism. And it's important, I really want to end on this note, it's this, for me that's the most important thing, this, I believe, this approach gives us a greater insight in the way in which Jews became lightning conductors for the crisis of capitalism. I'll leave you with this thought. In the period of the 21st century, Israel means Jews are in danger of becoming a lightning conductor for the crisis of imperialism. Thank you. Okay, it's a really good meeting, and I'm really pleased with the size of the meeting, given all the competitor meetings, and I think the arguments are incredibly important. There's a number of different points that have come up, and obviously only deal with them briefly. I'm particularly fascinated by what's happening in the German left party. For those of you who don't know, this is a new party which contains revolutionaries, but it's built out of older German left-wing parties, all of whom, understandably, suffer from German guilt because of the Holocaust. And that's very powerful, and it's played upon, and it makes it very difficult for, for Marxists to break through and say, hang about, we don't need to support Israel. And I don't have a, a short-term, easy solution to it. I know it's very hard for our comrades who are in the German left party who are trying to battle with this. I have a feeling that one route is going to be, actually, the revival of Marxist ideas themselves. The, 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 to build the case for Marxism as a real proper understanding of how society works, is a, especially because this, after all, is a land where Marxism developed. I mean, the great, and also Rosa Luxemburg, Marx, of course, being of Jewish origin. And Rosa Luxemburg is a little bit, I understand, becoming uh, resurfacing as a hero, heroine in the German left party. What, what a fantastic person as a symbol because she loathes the Zionists. What a fantastic person as a symbol to use to try to, to, to break this argument down. It's going to be very hard to break it down. I don't envy our comrades, but we have to help them do this. And I do think these basic arguments are very important. Now, very different, my good friend over here. You know, you know the problem with this argument about where they're Jewish traded in Alexandria 2,300 years ago is it's really difficult to prove one way or the other. Um, I mean, all I will say in return, look, you're quite right, of course, there were Jewish artisans, it was part of the kind of group. But those guys who were banging the metal and making silver and gold, etc., and all sorts of, uh, 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 of things with the silver and gold, they usually sold it themselves. There weren't others selling it. They're bound to have been traders. How many, I don't know. I want to move on to a slightly different point about Islam and Judaism. There's a very famous, and my chapter four in my Zionism book simply summarizes five volumes of Goitin's work on Jews at the height of Islamic civilization. It's absolutely the case. Jews were much better treated by Islam than they were by Christianity. And they, we, they got into very quite high positions in the Islamic political structures. And Islam itself is a massive, itself is a massive trading religion right across the Mediterranean, right through to India. And there are certainly, there's 
countless examples of Jewish and Muslim merchants working together. Goiti actually says at one point that the Jewish merchant class in Europe has its roots in this Islamic period. That's his speculation. He can't prove it. It's a hunch by him. It's just re- we have, we, the problem with this whole discussion is getting sufficient evidence to prove the case one way or the other. And of course the case is much easier to prove in Europe and to a degree that's where we're at at the moment. Though of course this is an ongoing uh, 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 argument. On Sabi's point, I just want to quote Trotsky. I know Sabi will enjoy, always enjoys a Trotsky quote. I think it's the most brilliant, <laughs> the most brilliant of all the kind of summing up a theory in two sentences. I think Trotsky does it actually. Um, which is, in the epoch of its rise, capitalism took the Jewish people out of the ghetto and utilised them as an instrument in its commercial expansion. Today, in decaying capitalist society, just before the Holocaust, it's striving to squeeze the Jewish people from all its pores. I think that formula is the correct formula, because it's in between. It's about not Jews controlling capitalism, but capitalism, first of all, got rid of the Jews, then used some of them in terms of its own expansion. And I think that's the relationship to understand that addresses the anti-Semitic argument, but it also begins to locate what the Jewish role was and to a certain degree still is. Um, just moving on now to the kind of the Israel arguments. No question, if Israel attacks Iran, is this going to be seen in religious terms? I think I'm kind of paraphrasing what the question was. I'm afraid it is. And this is a different meeting, but I just want to say it in a sentence or two. One, and it also applies to the comrades in Germany, perhaps more so. We've all got this in Europe. All the fold of the far left has this question about understanding political Islam. Political Islam is a modern movement. It's a mass movement. It has a left wing and a right wing. It has a wing that wants to relate to the secular left and a wing that doesn't. It's a highly complex, enormous movement. We have to understand it and engage in a dialogue in it. I would appeal to everybody to come to next year's Cairo conference, which is in late March. It's a brilliant weekend. You will see the proof of this, a dialogue between the secular left and all the great political Islamic movements. The Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas and Hezbollah are all have got representatives there. And you will see for yourselves that you cannot categorise this in so-called fundamentalist and certainly not in barbaric and, 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 and fascistic terms. This is a complex phenomenon, it's a different meeting, but unfortunately the speaker was quite right. The short-term response to Israel attacking in Iran will be seen in religious terms. The media here will hype that up big time. So we've got a special responsibility not only to stop that war happening, but if it does happen, to break down those arguments. And very finally, on the question of several questions... Um, about will left-wing Israelis challenge Israel? Actually, many of the best left-wing Israelis leave Israel. We've got several on the front row here. So what's one way of uh, uh, critical Israel's dealing with Israel is to get the hell out of the place. And you can't really blame them. Uh, but I actually also, I've just, I was in Haifa two weeks ago speaking at a conference of young Palestinians. And to my amazement, there were quite a few what I would call progressive Israeli Jews who'd come to quite a militant Palestinian meeting. And there is a minority. I think the analogy crudely is with the Africans and especially the Afrikaners in apartheid South Africa, what broke the Afrikaner racists, many of them, most of them, from the apartheid state was the uprising by black people and black workers in particular. What will break the best of the Jewish people in Israel from Zionism is a huge mass movement of Palestinians and a wider Arab population demonstrating conclusively a challenge to Zionism. People will then see they've got to break this. There's a huge amount of guilt in Israel. A lot of Israelis know the game is up in one form or another. It is such a violent society. That kind of, always people talk about, those of us who were brought up with Zionism were brought up with a dream Israel and it turned into a nightmare Israel when you get the facts and it's nightmare Israel big time and many Israelis really do know it. Very finally the question... I'm going to give a very short answer to this. It's a more complex answer, but I think it's an important answer in a simple word. Is Islamophobia the new anti-Semitism? The short answer is yes.